Ladies and gentlemen, fellows, 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 what is going on? Sal Vetcher here, and today we're talking about the bounce back wide receivers. Receivers that laid eggs last year, some partially due to injury, but for the most part, they played in 14 games or so, or the entire season in some cases, and they just laid eggs. For one reason or another, those things have now been cured, or at least in my mind, the situations that led them to have faulty seasons last year based on where we were picking them, and some guys, cough, cough, guy in the screen behind me was going in the top 10 at his position last year, finishing at the top 25 spot not what you want to get when you're looking for value in your drafts. But because we had such high expectations on them last year and they flopped, now this year, the expectation bar is absolutely falling down when, if anything, some of, and if not all of these situations are going to be better for these wide receivers who are now just one year removed from being at the peak of expectations, the peak of hype, and something that we were expecting a lot of points and a lot of upside out of all of them at the draft spots. And what I call that is flop lag. People got stung. People got hurt. Whether they actually had these players on their rosters or not, had to drop them, had to trade them, had to actually let them sink on their bench or in their starting lineups, God forbid. And now it's a situation where the market doesn't want those people. People are actually discussing it and communicating and got to see for the most part, even if you didn't own them, you got to see, ooh, that didn't look too great. Drafting the guy on my screen behind me, Odell, in the first round, and he didn't even produce for you what fourth and fifth round wide receivers were doing. Yeah, no, that doesn't seem too great. But because of this, they're dropping down boards. And at their average ADPs, I'm actually all about getting it where they are right now. And just in general, players who stunk the year before usually will see a slide in their average average draft position. Sometimes because of proper reasons, aging, bad quarterback play, bad offensive line. If you're a running back, bad offensive line and just aging there and just loss of agility and cut and burst in a different team and running back by committees and whatever it might be. But then in other cases, like the guys we'll talk about today, I think their situations have improved and people are just going to be maybe slow to realize it and recognize it, or maybe they'll just never recognize it. And we'll actually have a ton of value for nonstop. So welcome here. If you are new, my name is Sal Vetri. I cover fantasy sports and really right now going hard into fantasy fo- football in a ton of different areas. So please, if you have a second, take a second, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. It helps me out a ton. A big old one just popped up on the screen that allows me to reach a lot of more people. So if you enjoy this content, please do take a second. It's totally free to support me in that way by hitting the like button, hitting the subscribe button. And if you comment down below, if you just want to comment any type of feedback, mainly in the podcast reviews, I'll prioritize. But if there's none that come in that day, I'll prioritize the comment section here on YouTube. And at the end of the video, I will say a comment from the previous video that I just want to give a shout out to somebody, show a little bit of appreciation. And every single day and every single video, because I'm making these videos daily at this point, we're about 40 straight days in, maybe a little bit more, but we do a question of the day. And today's question of the day is, would you rather have the man on the screen behind me for 2020 fantasy football, we'll call it a PPR format, Odell Beckham Jr. or Mike Evans? Which one would you rather have? Let me know who and your reasoning down below in the comment section. You can take a second of your time and do that right now. So thank you. I appreciate you being here. Let's hop right into this one. Do not forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell at some point during this video. I would appreciate it if you did it right now. But let's start it off with our bounce back wide receivers for the 2020 fantasy football season. And numero uno is Odell Beckham Jr. So in 2019, Odell Beckham Jr., he was taken by a lot of people heading into the season in the first round. He was hyped by many to be a top three wide receiver pick, and even in some mocks was going off the board as a top 10 fantasy pick overall with the transition to Cleveland. People were expecting big things going with Baker Mayfield as he was getting hyped up last year, and similar to Odell this year, he might actually be a sleeper candidate with all the hype that absolutely flopped last year, but people were expecting Odell to go from the Giants and Eli, who could barely throw with his uh, spaghetti arm and noodly arm out there, to now, wow, Baker Mayfield, this young town extending. This offense looks fantastic, but everybody seemed to forget how bad their offensive line was, and it really became an issue. So Odell last year finished as a wide receiver 25 in fantasy football formats, and he played all 16 games, so injury was not a reason why, at least in terms of missing games, injury might have affected and likely affected his whole entire season, though. We'll talk about that in a second. But in 2019, he played on 97% of the snaps. He was out there. He was consistent in terms of just being on the field. He had 74 receptions for over 1,000 yards and four touchdowns on 133 targets. It came out to a 25.6% target share very solid. He averaged about 12.6 fantasy points per game. That was ranked 33rd overall, so that's not fantastic. He was 31st in deep targets behind only Kenny Galladay with 1.9 per game, so that's good to see. Those are upside targets, so 64.7 yards per game and had 4.6 receptions per game. Now, I think Odell is a number one bounce back candidate, and I think he might be the number one regression candidate in the entire NFL. Last year, he saw the number 45 overall target quality, and he only saw 74.4% of his targets to actually be deemed catchable, and what that means is they were just not accurate because Baker Mayfield was running for his life behind the 30th ranked protection unit in Cleveland last year 
They only protected him on 77.6% of the time for Baker. That ended up being 30th in the entire league. Not so great. So his catchable targets ranked 69th. The target quality ranked 45th. These are all really gross numbers. And he actually led the league in drops with 11. Those are things that I don't expect to happen yet again for Odell. I don't expect this offensive line to be anywhere near as bad. And that's because I'll throw up right now the additions and subtractions from the offseason. I'll circle Jack Conklin's name, former Tennessee Titan. That's a huge offensive tackle addition for them on this line. And then I'll circle in the NFL draft, Jedrick Willis's name, tackle in the first round, 10th overall pick out of Alabama. Those are two huge, huge pieces that are going to help this offensive line. They lose players like Greg Robinson, Eric Cush on the offensive line, Justin McCray. Those are not names that they'll care as much about compared to the guys that they're actually bringing in there. They bring in Evan Brown, who's also a center for some help there. Andy Janovich, who is a fullback that will help in the running game to an extent. And also just pass protection, pass pickups. It's a veteran fullback, one of the best ones in the entire NFL and the entire league. So I'll pop up all the rest of the regression reasons because I made this tweet a couple weeks ago and there's a ton of reasons and make sure to follow me on Twitter at Salvation DFS. It's pinned up on the screen if you're watching over here on YouTube, but the reasons for Odell in 2020, you have the offensive line improvement that we just touched on, right? He had surgery in January. He played all of last year and he started to mention it before the season started, maybe last August, last July, somewhere around there. He started to mention that he had this sort of pain and ended up being a, a sports hernia, a mid body muscle surgery is what they like technically called it as but he didn't end up missing any time he played through the entire thing so outside of just not having accurate passes that could probably be a reason why when you're playing all season long with a sports hernia so he had surgery on that in January of 2020 to get that all sorted out he saw 13 end zone targets not the red zone he was standing in the end zone when he was targeted and he only ended up seeing three touchdowns that ended up being the fourth most in the league in terms of his end zone targets but he only saw three touchdowns and he only saw four overall touchdowns on 133 targets so that just naturally is due to regress like outside of the injury outside of the offensive line play that was terrible if you're going to see and I expect Odell to see somewhere around a 25% target share if healthy again if you're going to see 125 plus targets you're going to just score more than four touchdowns if you're going to see 12 or more or in Odell's case 13 end zone targets you're going to score more than three touchdowns more times than not that conversion rate was extremely extremely low and then you factor in just the catchable targets the fact that he had 11 drops again the reason why that's regression is if he only has five drops this year that's an extra six receptions for the guy right or whatever it might be the less you drop obviously the better for your fantasy points and I don't expect Odell Beckham Jr. to back-to-back years in the entire in the league actually drop the ball and we started to see him actually improve towards the end of the year right it was that first week or two when he played the Jets he went off then he started to slow down a little bit and then he started to improve during the end of the year which would kind of correlate with the offensive line play the offensive line play was just flat out bad all year long but you actually get some sort of cohesion and some sort of camaraderie and just understanding of how you all play together as the season goes on no matter how bad you are you will likely improve unless there's of course injuries so the durability of Odell Beckham Jr. I mean he missed four games in his rookie season with a hamstring tear. That's why he broke out as a free agent. Many people picked him up in the waiver wire fantasy football and became instantly one of the human highlight reels in the NFL, obviously having his one-handed big old catch. And then he's had nagging injuries since then, but he didn't miss any time last year. He just played the entire season and had surgery in January for that sports hernia. Now, what is the target competition that Odell is going to be dealing with while he goes to Cleveland? And there's a good chunk. I mean, last year, the wide receiver one technically on this team was Jarvis Landry. You're going to have Jarvis Landry out there, the new acquisition in Austin Hooper out there, Kareem Hunt, the running back. They picked up his tenure. So he's back. Tywan Taylor, Damian Ratley. These are other wide receivers that are going to be depth pieces for them that are still there. Starting with Jarvis Landry, who I said touched on probably the wide receiver one last year, at least on the numbers. 95% of the snaps played primarily out of the slot, but did see 83 receptions. That led the team over 1,100 yards. That led the team in six touchdowns. And he saw 138 targets, five more than Odell last year. He ended up picking up 26.6% of the target share. But the big one, his red zone target share, 28.4. So Landry, who before really last year was not seen as this red zone threat or anything like that. He necessarily wasn't a red zone threat, just six total touchdowns on the entire season. But seeing almost 30% of your team's target share in the red zone, and you were looking that way, they were scheming you in, you were getting open. That's a big change from what we're used to out of Jarvis Landry. Outside of that, you have Austin Hooper coming from the number one passing offense last year, now heading into Cleveland. So even missing a couple games last year, I believe he missed three, he was still able to put up top six tight end numbers across the board. And a lot of that was just sustained and based on the fact that Atlanta was throwing so many times per game up there in terms of the most pass attempts per game in the entire league. They were number one in passing plays per game. So he played 73% of the snaps last year. He had 75 catches, just under 800 yards and six touchdowns. He saw 97 targets in those 13 games. And he was a big factor in the red zone. 18.5% target share for Atlanta in between the 20s. But once he got into the red zone, it spiked up to 25.7%. And I expect similar things to happen this year. So that could be a little bit of a knock against Odell. Like they had David Njoku last year hurt for a lot of the season. And they never had a true threat of a tight end in the red zone. Njoku's now back. 
Austin Hooper's now back. This can start to hit some of those uh, red zone numbers and end zone targets for Odell and bring those back down to earth and not have 13 this year. Maybe he's only at somewhere around six, seven, eight. And then Kareem Hunt, who only played the second half of the season, but was still able to play 54% of the snaps. He saw 37 receptions, ended up seeing three touchdowns and 45 targets. He averaged 5.6 targets per game down the stretch. This is going to hurt Nick Chubb miles more, maybe even Austin Hooper to an extent, but Nick Chubb miles more than it will hurt Odell. The only difference here is that Kareem Hunt was actually schemed into some plays in the red zone for screens that were designed for him, whatever it might have been, little end around type plays as he was coming out of the slot. That was just a couple of plays, though. I imagine they wanted to use those a little bit more so they can get Hunt and Chubb on the field. So that creativity in the red zone, if we see that enhanced, it could limit Odell. But then there's also the case that it could just take some attention off of Odell, which actually gets more one-on-ones for him and actually helps him. So Odell Beckham Jr. is my number one bounce back candidate when it comes to wide receivers this year. And he might be number one overall out of any position. I'm really high on Odell this year. He's currently my wide receiver nine. I see a lot of people ranking him outside their top 12. I think that's okay. I understand why you're doing it. I see a lot of people ranking him outside their top 15. I think you all are crazy. We were one year removed from a guy who was a top five wide receiver uh, easily by many. And he, people are arguing if he was the wide receiver two or three last year. Uh, and now just because of one bad season, which was pretty clearly, in my opinion, really just all tied up in bad coaching. That's all gone. And also really, really bad offensive line play from week one. Now that seems to be all cured and gone. I like where I'm at with Odell. He had the surgery. He's all healthy. Get yourself some Odell Beckham Jr. Before we keep going and talking about my man, Brandon Cooks, the new acquisition from the Houston Texans. I want to let you know about my draft guide. My draft guide is going to be, I've been working on this thing for months. Uh, it's going to have top 150s for PPR. It's going to have a top rookies, non-PPR. It's going to have all the tiers. It's going to have player profiles, blurbs for all these different players in the top 150s. I'm very excited about it. Bunch of stats, databases, reliability charts, key stats, databases. It is only going to be if you are eligible, $10 this year. I'm going to have it set up through Monkey Knife Fight, and I'll see if we can get some other sponsors. But for right now, Monkey Knife Fight, if you use the code SALFREE, I'm going to probably end up changing that code to Sal NFL if you're watching this later on. But for right now, it's Sal Free. So if that ends up working, instead of getting the draft guide for $30, you only get it for $10. So it's easier for you to purchase. It's easier for me to sell. They get an acquisition. So all that stuff can be used by going to Monkey Knife Fight. If you already have an account, it will not work. If you're in a state where Monkey Knife Fight is not legal, it will not work. If you already have an account, just make another account. You'll save yourself 20 bucks. Uh, but if it does not actually end up working because Monkey Knife Fight's only eligible, I think somewhere in around like 40 states, well, then you can just go to the normal site. The site will be launching in mid June. I will have an announcement pretty shortly. But by the time mid June hits, I'll be having everything in the description of all of these videos. If you want the draft guide and you believe in my work based on these videos, I put so much time and effort into this thing. And the fact that it's only going to cost you $10 might be the best value in the entire world that you've ever spent $10 on. So it's going to be overwhelming information. Trust me. I hope you enjoy it. Please do down below. You can check it out. Monkey Knife Fight. Sal Free is the promo code for over there. That is Monkey Knife Fight. So next on the board, we have our man, Brandon Cooks. Now the former Ram last year, now turned Houston Texan after free agency in the Texans, like they did with David Johnson. Now picking up a big chunk of Brandon Cooks contract to the dead cap this year. But Brandon Cooks, I mean, this is a guy who last year in 14 games played on 72% of the snaps with the Rams. He ended up finishing as the wide receiver 62. And yes, he did miss two games. So that's going to impact it. But he still would have finished outside the top 40. I'm going to show you so many things that were just absolutely terrible on a per game basis, not overall because he missed the two games. But on a per game basis, that's how you can compare it across every single player. He was just absolutely brutal compared to 2018 and the rest of his seasons. And there's some reasons why that aren't all his fault. But last year, only 42 receptions for 583 yards and just two touchdowns on only 72 targets. He only saw a 12.9% target share when he was active, but only 7% in the red zone. He's never been known to be a red zone threat, but 7% is just oddly, oddly low. Now I'll pop this up on the screen right now because he quickly became the wide receiver three in this offense behind Cooper Cup and Robert Woods last year, and likely the fourth option, especially the second half of the year when Tyler Higby started to explode. But even in the beginning of the year, fourth option behind the running game in Todd Gurley. He had 5.1 targets per game last year. That was down by, from 7.7 .7 in 2018. That is a huge knock of 2.6 per game. He had three receptions per game last year. That is down from 5.3 in 2018, 2.3 per game, 41.6 yards per game last year. In 2018, it was at 80.3. 80.3, almost 40 yards of difference, 8.4 fantasy points per game last year, ranked 67th overall. He was at 16.2, almost double the amount in 2018. That was ranked much, much higher in the top 25. And another big one in terms of efficiency, 13.9 yards per reception last year was ranked 38th. That was down from 15.1 yards per reception in 2018, which was inside right around the top 30. So why did this all happen? Well, partially it was maybe just a drop in play, just priority of just Robert Woods continuing to be consistent, Cooper Cup breaking out and having that close relationship with Jared Goff. And then obviously Tyler Higby breaks out a ton down the stretch, maybe a little bit of the concussion fog. I know he was in and out of one or two of those games, and then he finally was done for the season. But I think a big piece of it was also the partially bad play of Jared Goff, which stems from the really, really bad offensive line play. Now think about it. Brandon Cooks is a deep threat target, and the Rams ranked 
29th in the amount of time they gave Jared Goff to throw last year in pass blocking efficiency, which ended up making Goff rank the 30th deep ball throw in the league. There's only 32 starting quarterbacks and Goff was ranked 30th in deep ball accuracy last year because his offensive line was ranked 29th in the actual time they gave Goff to throw. And now Brandon Cooks enters a situation where hopefully he's healthy. I've had concussion issues. I've had concussions that have lingered for an entire year, having to wear sunglasses for a year, all those types of things. It is scary. So I hope he's being safe. But now he enters a position where in Houston, they ranked number six in pass blocking last year. Run blocking is not as great, but Laramie Tunsil, they give up all the first round picks for him. They rank sixth overall. He delivers for them. And Deshaun Watson, one of the most accurate quarterbacks in the league, he threw the fourth most deep balls last year when his eighth in deep ball accuracy. So man, now you're coming into a situation where Cooks goes from just literally bottom of the barrel, bottom three in the league situation for offensive line play and deep ball accuracy to now you're you're quickly approaching top five territory in the entire league in quarterback play and deep ball attempts per game. And now offensive line blocking for those deep balls. This is starting to look really good. I'll throw up Ian Harden's tweet right here. And it's very simple. It says one of these guys is going to emerge as Deshaun Watson's new wide receiver one. And I bring up this point because yes, DeAndre Hopkins, we haven't said it yet. It's the elephant in the room, but he's no longer there. And Will Fuller only playing 11 games last year, always dealing with some sort of groin or hamstring injury lower body body injury is not anywhere near a lock to be a number one receiver on this team because of those injuries, but also just in general, Brandon Cooks fits the mold more of a number one wide receiver, in my opinion, than Will Fuller does. I think he's a little bit more physical. I think he runs better routes overall in the intermediate and even short range than Will Fuller. Then when it comes to Randall Cobb and Kenny Stills, Randall Cobb will be turning 30 right around the time the season kicks off. So I don't think that's a knock against him. The man still had 55 receptions over 800 yards in a top three passing offense last year. He'll probably split some of the time with Kenny Stills, who was just brutal on the outside when Will Fuller was hurt last year. But in the side, he actually looked pretty good. I wouldn't be shocked if one of these guys gets cut. It will create a decent sized cap hit that they've already taken on so much cap hits. But again, it's Bill O'Brien running this team as now a coach and de facto general manager, whatever actually is going on there. So I think it's going to be between Will Fuller and Brandon Cooks. And if you tell me that Brandon Cooks just stays healthy or even just plays 14 games, maybe he gets some sort of sensitivity with a concussion and hopefully he doesn't. But whatever happens, I think Brandon Cooks in this offense would still a top five quarterback, in my opinion, in the NFL right now, Deshaun Watson out there and an, a huge improved offensive line, which helped him a ton last year. Why can he not take on a huge huge chunk of what a guy in DeAndre Hopkins left behind last year. I think he's a number one candidate to take on a lot of that target share and a lot of those overall production numbers. So Brandon Cooks for me right now, I mean, he's going in ADPs like outside the top 30 wide receivers. I have him right around there. Like he's going outside the top 35. He's right around wide receiver 40. He's right around like my wide receiver 32. And he just keeps moving up for me because I really do think that he's going to slide in as the number one receiver on this team, as long as he is healthy. And all indications right now say that the former first round pick, pick 20th overall when he was drafted by the Saints is going to be healthy, at least for the start of the season. So I do like that a lot. When you just look at durability though, like, yes, he has the concussion issues. That's the big thing. You can see the quote by Bill O'Brien. He's only missed two games since 2015. Like he's had all these concussion issues, but he has only missed two games since the start of 2015. And those games were actually ended up being last year, two games due to concussions that is. So I do think this is a big issue. Concussions are no joke at all. They can easily be triggered, especially for a receiver, especially if you're going to go over the middle of the field at any point, but I'm sure they'll try and be somewhat safe with that while he goes over the middle of the field. Now you have a situation where yes, he only has missed two games compared to Will Fuller's track record, which is, um, maybe just as similar in terms of how sensitive concussions can be to how sensitive muscles can be and actually tendons can be when you have hamstring tears, when you have just hamstring and poles and and groins and ACLs and tendons, whatever that might end up being uh, that Will Fuller has had to deal with in the past, those are going to be major concerns as well. So I'll pop up what the Texans did in the offseason. They obviously got Brandon Cooks and Randall Cobb, kind of touched a little bit on them. We'll touch a little bit more in a second. They get David Johnson in the backfield, who was a very good receiver last year, believe it or not, top 10 in a lot of receiving categories for running backs on a per game efficiency and production standpoint. And then they ended up losing the big one, DeAndre Hopkins, their leading rusher who went for over a thousand yards and is now going to slot in as the backup on the Seattle Seahawks and Carlos Hyde. And then in the NFL draft, they got even more offensive line help, right? They ended up losing really nobody in terms of offensive line that mattered. They added an offensive tackle and free agency. And then they add Charlie Heck in the fourth round. So this offensive line continues to get bolstered a little bit. Heck's going to improve maybe the running game a little bit, but really just the depth in general. So I do like that. So what is the target competition here? Well, it's Will Fuller, Randall Cobb, it's Kenny Stills, right? Those are the three wide receivers. They have a lot of talented wide receivers, in my opinion, on this team. A lot of fast wide receivers when it comes to Fuller, Cooks, and Kenny Stills. And then there's also David Johnson, who should probably be used as a pass catcher, but this offense in general, Deshaun Watson threw to the bottom three times in the entire NFL, third least last year to the running back. And I mean, you had Duke Johnson out there, but you mainly had Carlos Hyde on the field. So it could be a little bit skewed based on the skill set of Hyde not being a pass catcher. I believe he only caught somewhere around like 10 to 12 balls last year on 14 targets. So Will Fuller in 11 games ended up seeing 71 targets. It was 20.7% of the target share. You can see on the screen right now, he produced 670 yards on 49 receptions and three touchdowns. He had 13.7 yards per reception, ranked outside the top 40, not something you're used to out of Will Fuller. But a lot of that was because he started to see 
see more red zone receptions and red zone targets. So obviously those receptions are just not going to be that far. If you're at the eight yard line and you catch a touchdown or catch a pass and you drop down at the two yard line, you just don't have the ability to actually get more yards. There's not as much field to deal with. So I think that skewed it a little bit. 12.2 fantasy points per game ranked 37th for Fuller last year. And now in the slot, you're going to have a battle between the new acquisition, Randall Cobb, and the acquisition that they had last year and Kenny Stills. Both guys making very similar money and would be a similar cap hit. So it's going to be interesting to see, especially since they just signed Cobb. I doubt they cut either of these guys, even though they, they should try and cut one or trade one, but it's just going to cost them the same amount of money and they have already so much cap hit. So Randall Cobb last year with the Cowboys played on 68.8% of the snaps. He ended up seeing 83 targets, but it only ended up being 15.5% of the target share because Dallas threw top five in the league. They ended up finishing, I believe, with 4,901 yards, which was top three in the league for Dak. And Cobb brought in 55 receptions for over 800 yards and three touchdowns. Now he came in from a top three offense. Like we said, he's about to turn 30. He's technically right now, according to player profiler, 29.8 years old. And he led the league out of the slot and drops. So we had Odell, we talked about, led the league in the drops to start just overall. And Randall Cobb led the league in drops out of the slot. But he was still productive last year. I mean, this is a guy that, this is why they got him, might have overpaid for him, but still productive as he's approaching year 30. And then Kenny Stills last year, who was just brutal on the outside. He was much more success when he was in the slot. That's where he scored a couple of his touchdowns when Will Fuller was healthy compared to when Will Fuller was out and he was forced to play on the outside. They went to more two tight end sets. They went to more Kiki Kute in the slot and DeAndre Carter and Stills just struggled to get on the outside. He was 83rd in separation when playing on the outside and he saw just two red zone receptions in 13 games on 55 total targets. He finished with a 13.4% target share on 73% of the snaps, caught 40 balls for 561 yards and four touchdowns. So I really don't think there's honestly a threat to Brandon Cooks. Like Will Fuller, I think is a very good wide receiver too. I don't think Will Fuller takes a step to being a wide receiver one. I don't think he's that type of build. I think he's a very good deep threat. I think he's good at getting separation when he's healthy, but I don't think he's great in the short to intermediate range outside of screens. Whereas I think Brandon Cooks is a very dominating wide receiver when it comes to the intermediate range of explosiveness and getting separation there. And then obviously we know how good he can be down the field. In the short range, yeah, these are none of these guys are technicians in terms of route running abilities. And none of them out of Randall Cobb, Kenny Stills. Cobb used to be, but I wouldn't say he is anymore. Uh, and at this point, yeah, I think that your best receiver on your entire team all around is Brandon Cooks. So give me Brandon Cooks. I'll take him inside the top 35 as a lot of people take him outside the top 35 this year. He finished at 62 last year after missing a few games. Even if he misses a game or two this year, I don't think he's going to finish outside the top 60 at overall wide receivers for PPR. He is my bounce back number two wide receiver. The final wide receiver for this video is going to be Juju Smith-Schuster. And before we get into it, take a second, hit that like button. It takes two seconds of your time if you're still watching on the YouTube. If you're watching on the podcast, hit the subscribe button and leave a podcast review for your chance to be featured at the end of this video and podcast, but also just because it's a nice thing to do. It helps me reach more people. And then if you're watching on YouTube, please hit the big old subscribe button that just popped up on the screen. That helps a ton. And the notification bell, the more that you watch, the more that people do that during the videos it says hey hey youtube this, these people like sales content they're interacting they're engaging they're joining the community in the video show this to more people so it helps me out a ton so i appreciate all of that hop into the discord down below it's totally free we're all chatting nfl we're making some mock drafts in there we're doing a lot of stuff so come into that totally free down below so juju smith schuster he only played in 12 games so his finish as the 65th wide receiver it's obviously skewed because he missed four games so we're not going to hold that against him but even in the games that he was playing as you'll see on a per game basis we're not good and why was that it really did not have to do with Juju. Like this was all out of his hands. Some of the other receivers that had to do with their drops, like Odell, it had to do with maybe their separation numbers or something else downfield. They're just falling down in the pecking order of their offense, like Brandon Cooks. But Juju, he was the number one receiver last year. Yes, Deontay Johnson, I'm, I'm very high on him. He's a top 35 receiver for me this year. Yes, Deontay Johnson started to break out and actually outproduced Juju down the stretch. But it was all the quarterback play that hurt him last year. Big Ben gets hurt two weeks into the season, and you're automatically not worth your second or third round draft capital where Juju was going last year. And then you tack on the injury to go on top of it, and he's just leaving a nasty taste in a lot of people's mouths. Now, people who didn't own Juju last year, and there's a good chunk of sharp fantasy analysts who are hyping up Juju this year. And I agree with it. I'm not as high on those guys as Juju being like a top 10 or top 12 wide receiver. He's my wide receiver 15 right now, but I understand it. Now in those 12 games last year, Juju played on 79% of the snaps. He caught 42 balls, just not great overall production, 72 targets and 18.3% of the target share. That did spike in the red zone. These inexperienced quarterbacks, you go to the guy that you would trust the most, the name that maybe you know the most in Juju, 21% of the target share in the red zone. But on a per game basis, it was not good. It was ugly. 9.4 fantasy points per game, just 46 yards per game and six targets per game. That is not good. But this is why only 72.2% of his targets were catchable. That was 85th in the league. We talked about how Odell was ranked 69th in the league in that department and how bad that hurt him. Juju's was ranked 89th in the league. He saw the 86th ranked target quality. Odell's target quality at 45th was bad, but that makes this look fantastic compared to Juju's at 86. I mean, you have a guy named Duck Hodges, Devlin Hodges, throwing you the ball, a Devlin, if you know that movie, just absolutely gross. Then you have Mason Rudolph, who maybe for a half of a week to a week looked pretty decent. And then they said, you know what? Let's just throw the ball to Jalen Samuels 10 times per game. Let's just give 
the ball to Benny Snell 15 times per game when James Conner is hurt. That's how bad we think Mason Rudolph is. We're literally scheming for a, a former tight end in college who's now a running back and Benny Snell, who is as slow as dust and, and he can't even get more than two yards per carry out here. That's what we're going with overthrowing the ball with Mason Rudolph. That's how bad it got last year. Then Devin Hodges comes in and it just do that even more, but now run the ball with Devlin Hodges as well. Just gross. So Pitt only threw 39.9 times per game with a combo of Mason Rudolph and Duck Hodges and barely any Big Ben. But what happened in 2018 that everybody forgets about? And I get it. Big Ben is approaching 40, but he's not in his 40s and quarterbacks can still play into their 40s. And sure, Jay Glazer can say what he wants in the offseason about Big Ben not doing anything. Is Jay Glazer really there with him nonstop? He says Big Ben just eating food and playing video games and doing yoga and golfing. Is, is he really there with Big Ben nonstop? I think these things are a little bit a hearsay and what you hear about maybe one or two days of their offseason, not their entire offseason. I'm pretty sure Big Ben has gone to the gym at least once this offseason. Otherwise, he would look like a 500 pound monster. And since he shaved, he does not look anything like that. But Big Ben in 2018, people forget, led the entire league, the Steelers offense in pretty much every category. 675 pass attempts. It was 42.2 per game. That was first. 5,129 yards, over 5,100 yards. That was first. 34 passing touchdowns. That was first. He also added three rushing touchdowns. 84 deep ball attempts, third in the NFL. 20.8 fantasy points per game, third in the NFL. 7.3 adjusted yards per attempt, seventh in the NFL. You can see all those stats up on the screen. And yes, I mean, that was a different offense when they had James Conner really hitting his stride as a younger player, when they had Antonio Brown still there, when it was Juju's breakout year for like 1,400 yards as a rookie. I get all that stuff, but it was also an offense that operated well and Big Ben was accurate. He was productive. And I don't know why a whole year of an offseason is going to shift everybody to think he's now outside of like the top 20 quarterbacks in the league. And maybe he is. Maybe the injury and the age just means that he absolutely stinks this year. But I find it hard to believe that Big Ben's going to come back this season and just absolutely lay an egg as one of the worst quarterbacks in the league. Or at least here's the way to put it, at least be as bad as Mason Rudolph or Devlin Hodges, aka Duck Hodges was last year. It's just not going to happen. So what do the Steelers do in the offseason? They don't really add much to threaten Juju. They add Eric Ebron, who may be in the red zone becomes more of a threat and that hurts a little bit. They don't really lose much at all. They lose a tight end and Nick Vanette. You can see they lose a fullback. They ended up adding a fullback. TJ Watt's brother, Derek Watt. So not much. In the draft, they had maybe some threat, which is Chase Claypool, who a lot of people are saying maybe he's a tight end. We'll talk about his profile in a second. They say they want to use him as an outside wide receiver. They had a very talented running back in Anthony McFarlane in the fourth round, who is getting hyped up by myself even. I'm, I'm guilty of it, but hopefully by the time the preseason comes, we have a little bit more of an idea if he's actually going to be the backup here and not the third string because it could just be a Darwin Thompson situation from last year where everybody was hyping him up as the backup. And then the Chiefs go and sign LeSean McCoy and it ruins all the Darwin Thompson hype. So Juju's injury history. In 2017, his rookie year, he missed a game with a hamstring. And then last year, he missed those five games. And really, it was about four and a half games with a concussion and a knee sprain. Now, what is the target competition going to be for Juju? Well, it's going to be Deontay Johnson, who was a breakout rookie last year. And I think he's going to be a breakout sophomore this year, played special teams, but he also was very, very highly productive just in terms of on offense with these bad quarterbacks. James Washington, then some tight ends in Eric Ebron and Vance McDonald, and then the rookie in Chase Claypool. Deontay Johnson played 67% of the snaps. He started to come in around week three or week four for Dante Moncrief, who was just dropping the ball nonstop. And actually came out later on that Dante Moncrief was playing with a dislocated finger. So hard to knock him too much, but yeah, Deontay Johnson having over 650 yards five touchdowns on 92 targets, so 18.9% of the target share. That was actually more than Juju Smith-Schuster's target share. He's the number one wide receiver in the entire league in separation and number two in broken tackles. Those are some insane numbers. We have James Washington out there who operated as the wide receiver three for most of last year, wide receiver two when Juju was hurt. He caught 44 balls on a 16.9% target share, scored three touchdowns over 700 yards. Rookie out of Notre Dame, Chase Claypool, his profile from last year, 66 receptions for over 1,000 yards and 13 touchdowns on a 28.6% target share, 15.7 yards per reception. He is built like a tight end. 6'4 and 238 pounds. There's a lot of rumors that he might be used like a tight end, but based on the fact that the Steelers got Eric Ebron and what they've said early on, they want to use him as an outside receiver. So he should probably threaten more so James Washington for who's going to be the wide receiver three in this team behind Juju out of the slot and behind Deontay Moncrief as likely the X receiver. And then lastly, Eric Ebron, who regressed in a major way, scored 14 touchdowns in 2018, only scored three last year. A big reason why, no more Andrew Luck, a big reason why, natural regression. In 2019, Ebron in 11 games had 31 receptions, three touchdowns, over 350 50 yards barely on a 15.5% target share, but still was used in the red zone 20.4% of the time there. He saw a big spike, but he quit on the team after 11 games and said, I'm not playing with you guys anymore. Told his agent, I'm not showing up. And then he quit and then he gets signed by the Steelers. So I don't know what you want to say about that, but that's what Eric Ebron did. So that's where I'm at with Juju. Like I do think Dante Johnson takes a step forward. So I don't think it makes Juju a top eight receiver, but I do think he has that upside. I mean, we saw it his rookie year. Now he has a couple more years in the league and now he has big Ben coming back. So I do think there's a lot of upside. I think that the Steelers offense, we've seen it before, can sustain two top 20 or even two top 20 wide receivers or even more like Deontay Johnson. He's my wide receiver 34, I believe right now. 
he could easily be a top 25 wide receiver if he breaks out. And there's no question in my mind that Juju can be a top 20 or top 15 wide receiver or even higher this year. So I do think this offense, I'm very high on it. I'm bullish on it. You can you can hear and listen to the people that say, nah, Big Ben's going to be terrible. This offense is going to be janky. It's going to be awful. Okay. Their offensive line, it takes a little bit of a hit, but nowhere near as much of a hit in the passing game as it did in the running game. So still a solid pass blocking unit. You have Big Ben back. You have your weapons healthy. You have a breakout candidate in Deontay Johnson. You have running back depth now in Anthony McFarlane, tight end depth in Eric Ebron. I like this offense. I do. So everybody can knock on the old guy in Big Ben, but nobody's knocking on the old guy in Tom Brady and Drew Brees and any of that. I don't buy it. I like the Steelers offense. My number three bounce back wide receiver is Juju Smith Schuster. Today's comment of the day is by Harry as I'm going to pop it up on the screen by Harry. I don't want to mess up your last name, but the hall wall, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But Harry just says, awesome show, bro. Very helpful. Very quick to the point. I like it. I like the people who put some thought in with the long paragraphs. I like the people who say actionable, quick things. So thank you, Harry. I appreciate you for your comment. If you want to be featured in the comment of the day, I'll prioritize the podcast reviews, the Sal Vetri show. Be sure to download the episode but mainly just be sure to subscribe and leave a review. It helps me out a ton, really helps me reach more people. But on the YouTube comments, get down below. I'll be choosing one person as well who says something nice about the show, something nice about my work, or has a thoughtful message to share with the community. So thank you so much. And now, we're done with the show, but please, please hit the subscribe button and the like button before you go. I urge you, if you like this show, if you got anything from it and you're not yet subscribed, or maybe you don't know, just double check. It really does help me out a ton. And lastly, the draft guide is going to be out very shortly. The website's going to be launching mid-June, but you can get in on some of these offers early on for 66% off by using that promo code. It's going to be Sal NFLs very soon, so maybe wait a couple days, but Sal Free will work right now. They'll send me your email. I'll send you a free coupon once the draft guide releases. And to finish it up by answering the question of the day and hopping into the Discord yourself, question of the day today, would you rather own number nine ranked wide receiver for myself, Odell Beckham Jr. or Mike Evans, who right now is my number 10. So I'm dealing with it a little bit myself. Who would you rather own Odell this year in a PPR format or Mike Evans? Let me know down below. Thank you so much for tuning into this video. You all rock. You make this the most fun job I can possibly have. Thank you for the support. We're continuing to grow this awesome community. And that's all because of you, ladies and gentlemen, and the fellas, fellas, fellas. So peace out, everybody. I'll see you all in the next one.